hope you don't drive 80 miles an hour to get back. Oh, it did? No, it did. That's a pretty good number. That's, that's fabulous. Good evening. Good evening. I call this Iowa City Community School Board meeting on Tuesday, April 10th, 2018 to order. My name is Janet Godwin, and I want to thank those in the audience, those watching on television, and those following us on Twitter for joining us tonight. I'll start by introducing those at the table with me. To my right, Superintendent Steve Murley and Directors Ruthina Malone, Phil Hemingway, Lori Rotland, J.P. Clausen, Sean Eyestone, Paul Ressler, and Kim Colvin, Recording Secretary. The public is reminded that if they wish to speak, they need to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in. During community comment, persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda items and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. So with that, we will move into our agenda for the night. And first up, we have student representatives. Um, Tegan from City High, welcome back from Des Moines. Hi, yes. Good evening, uh, school board members. Uh, I just have a very short report for you all. Uh, City High will be having their production of Little Shop of Horrors starting on April 20th until the 22nd. You're all welcome to, in to uh, view the City High Dramas Department's latest production. Dr. Terrence Roberts of the Little Rock Nine also visited City High School last Friday to give an amazing talk and perspective in a crucial part of American history. I was very unfortunate in not being able to see it, but I'm very glad that he did come to our school. Uh, 13 City High students came to uh, Model United Nations in Cedar Falls last week. Uh, two students received outstanding delegate paper awards at the conference. Mock trial qualified and participated in the state competition for mock trial. City High Interact Club, as well, hosted a blood drive for the University of Iowa Health Clinic this past week. Many students participated in giving blood for the health clinic. Best Buddies sent a busload of buddies to Des Moines for the Best Buddies Ball. They were unfortunately, they were originally supposed to go to Cedar Rapids, but had to change that uh, due to the snowstorm the other week. City High Jazz Ensemble placed sixth in the state, and City High Men's Soccer ranked fourth in the state. That is all from City High. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, West High, Zena Mackey, Ala Ali. So to start off, students Joseph Wan and Arshak Salim were crowned the Iowa State Chess Co-Champions this year. Joseph Wan also becomes Iowa's youngest chess um, player to grab the title. On Saturday night, two weeks ago, over 60 West High students participated in the second annual multicultural fashion show, Walk It Out. Senior Sean Thacker and junior Sophia Chen directed the event, which included students showing fashions from five cultural groups, East Asia, South Asia, Latin America, Africa, and Black. It was a great show, so if you couldn't make it this year, be sure to attend next year and you won't regret it. National recognition um, for the West High story um, also came out. The West, High, the West High story staff was in the top three of the 125 schools with winning entries. Um, congratulations to West High social studies teacher and debate coach Megan Johnson on receiving the ICCSD China Award. The West High Jazz Ensemble had an impressive fifth place showing at the Iowa State Jazz Championships on Thursday, April 5th in Ames. The band played extremely well and placed the highest of any band in Eastern Iowa, losing out only to Des Moines area bands. The West High uh, Science Olympiad team um, excelled in this year's competition uh, for Science Olympiad. It was led by co-captains Adam Conrad and Brandon Hu. And this year, the West High placed sixth in the state. Dr. Terrence Roberts, a part of the Little Rock Nine, who were the first students to integrate Little Rock Central High School, spoke to West High students last Friday, thanks to the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library. 
During the Q&A period, he was asked if he could ever truly forgive his tormentors, and um, to paraphrase his response, he said, I only have so much time in this world, I'm not going to spend it in hatred. Okay, this past January, West participated in a Harvard research study in which researchers worked with a panel of students to make non-evaluative observations in classrooms to observe the climate with respect to racial dynamics. They will be returning later this month to do a follow-up. And that's everything I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is uh, Shane Snap here from Liberty, Liberty High? Mm, I'm seeing no. How about uh, Savannah from Tate? Okay, we'll move on to the ICEA update and Brady. Hi, uh, President Godwin, uh, Director, Superintendent Murley. Thanks for having us again. Um, I'm excited about the new format tonight. I'm just gonna put that out there. So I'll, uh, that's, I hope that it goes well um, for everybody. And I'd just like to say thanks for our uh, ability to participate on the Ed Committee. I feel like we have some great conversations and discussions. Uh, you know, and I appreciate that we have membership on that committee. I want to extend our um, uh, sincere invitation to all of you to our ICEA awards banquet and celebration. It is, it, we have a little bit of time, but it's on Thursday, May 10th. And I'll send this out to you in an email as well. Our theme is red, white, and blue barbecue. It is, we're changing venues. This, uh, we had, I know, we had a big turnout last year, which was awesome. So it's at the Pleasant Valley Golf Course, uh, we're off of Sand Road. Uh, Senator Bob Dvorsky is our featured guest. Uh, he's retiring from the Senate, as we all know. He will be our guest speaker as well. Uh, so, um, you know, we start gathering at 5, 5.15 and dinner and awards and uh, his keynote are around 5.30. So we'd love to see all of you there if you're able to make it. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. Um, we will now move into the community comment portion of our agenda. And first up, we have Henry Timmer Hackert. And following him will be Miriam Kita. You want me to go first? Yes, All right. please. I am Miriam Timmer Hackert from 1911 Lindcrest Drive. Um, Henry attends Coralville Central, where we have a garden club. And over the winter this year, we decided to talk about climate chaos as well as poison ivy and other stuff. Um, but the kids got really into the whole idea of climate change and what we can do as individuals and as our school to try and stop that and to be better stewards of the earth. And so we wanted to know like how much solar panels would cost. And so we asked a representative from Moxie Solar to come talk to us and it was so interesting. And he has great news. He thinks that he could get an investor to buy it so that they can take the tax credits and then it would just save us money immediately because instead of paying a big solar bill, uh, sorry, a big electrical bill, we would be paying a small bill to MidAmerican and then a small bill to the investor who put the solar panels up. And Moxie Solar has been super easy to work with and they do all the permits and stuff like that. Henry, do you want to share about solar um, panels? So the solar panels would be up on our roof. Luckily, there are too many shadows, and um, also this is one of the things we said about they'd be free because of the private investors. So we are hoping that we could try and get them up on our roof, so that way we could try to already start saving money. Um, oh yeah, also this is just another bonus. You don't have to shovel snow off of them. <laughs> <laughs> that is a bonus. We asked to make sure. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> So we just kind of need a go ahead, and I'll email you guys about this. Um, but really, the investors would pay for the insurance. Moxie would figure out where to put them and how to get the investors. So all we need to do is like give them permission to look at our electrical usage and then kind of give them a go ahead. So good news. Thank you. Please send that um, proposal uh, yeah. to us, and we'll take a look for yeah. sure. Thank you. Thank you, Henry and Miriam. Um, up next, Miriam Kita, and following Miriam is Stephanie Van Heusen. My 
name is Maria Mkeda. I'm a sophomore at City High, as well as a member of the Students Against Same Discrimination. And I just wanted to give you all an update on what's happened since the last school board meeting in terms of our communication with district and administration on the ethnic studies course that was canceled. So uh, last Tuesday, Lujane and I, Lujane is the SOD representative from West High, met with Kingsley Botchway, Yolanda, Paul, and uh, no one else is coming to mind. I'm sorry, Diane. Diane. Yeah. Diane. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. But you were there too. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about some ideas or potential options for next year. Uh, including the PSEO option and what some outcomes for that might look like, as well as a potential lecture series that could take place after school on Thursdays where students could possibly get a certificate of achievement that says they've had like ethnic studies course experience. And we just wanted to thank the district and administration for a follow-up in terms of that, that was all of that information from the meeting was relayed back to Saad, and we also shared a list of nine potential themes for the lecture series, so I'm hoping to present those later today. And honestly, I just wanted to say thank you for following up. That was all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, Stephanie. Hello, my name is Stephanie Van Hoosen, rhymes with Susan, and I'm here as a former employee, a former homeless liaison for the district, a former member of the 2009 redistricting committee, and active in redistricting efforts since 2008. I'm educated with a master's in education, 2000, and a master's in social work, 2010. And I've worked with homeless persons and their families since 2003, 15 years. I'm here because I do not want you throwing more money at Mark Twain Elementary construction without asking hard questions. First, I want you to examine the Mark Twain data and possible options before you move forward. Secondly, I ask that you stop the nonsense of believing everything that comes before you without asking for data and time to think about your votes. This type of decision should not be an item on a consent agenda. It should never be a decision made on a recommendation without complete and truthful information backing it up. So me, I'm here because I do not want the district failing our most vulnerable kids. I want us to use our money, money wisely and to achieve equity for all of our children. You might think that since I've been around the district and I was fired by the superintendent that my recommending you to stop and look at data and alternative solutions is just sour grapes. But please know that is not so. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to continue to advocate for children and youth in my community. And I will not stop. I want to suggest that there are many questions you might want to ask of administration about the kids who are homeless attending Mark Twain Elementary and Twain's ability to teach all of their kids. Miss Iowa on December 23, 2017 presented some data that was on the front page of Twain's Facebook page and tells us this girl, school serves four shelters and has 55 homeless kids attending there. Is this totally true? Is this data disaggregated and in a way that can lead you to make better decisions about what's going on at Mark Twain? I would say based on my knowledge, this is a, a story and it's not totally factual. It does pull at your heartstrings and makes everyone want to rush and help Mark Twain. Has the district homeless li liaison given you the board honest reasons why they educate such a high number of homeless students? Has the liaison given you reasons why the numbers jumped so dramatically in recent years at Mark Twain School since I was fired? There is a reason. Has the homeless liaison given you information about the agreement she offered to Shelter House when the new shelter was being proposed at 429 Southgate? That was before 2010. Has district administration explained that had they followed the McKinney-Vento Homeless Education Act, Federal legis legislation 
and the Iowa legislation that has been in existence since 1991, we wouldn't be in this situation now? You can ask, as a board, why now is this a problem? You can ask what efforts the administrators made to resolve this problem pr prior to asking for between forty-five dollars and $90,000 just to draw up a plan for an additional two rooms for a, a newly refurbished school. You can ask that. I would ask, why are we continuing to add on to new schools using RAM as the rationale when we are not even sure that RAM effects are statistically significant? Why aren't kids being kept in their school of origin? I would ask that if I were the board. And my second point is that you stop believing everything you are told. You need to be well informed before you authorize dollars being spent. And the clue is redistricting is the answer. Stephanie, you're out of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comments tonight. Would you like copies of them? Sure, There's please. That would be fantastic. Very last bit too. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Um, we will move on to the agenda approval. Um, before I take a motion to approve the agenda, I would like to propose a modification um, to move the ethnic studies item from discussion to presentation so that students can participate in that discussion with Diane. Um, and so that's a, a proposed modification to the agenda. So moved. Second. Kim, ready to vote? is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you, Kim. Next up, consent agenda. Before we move in, Phil, comments on the bills this month. Yes. Um, uh, it was 1.569 million. Uh, $50,730 from uh, GoFund uh, bond uh, funding. And uh, I had uh, a couple of questions, a couple of things I'll bring to light. And uh, speaking with uh, um, uh, Craig, uh, I think it would be uh, enlightening for the community to see uh, the invoice for Power School from Grantwood AEA and the notes that are on that. And I talked with Craig and he said it would be okay if we released that. So uh, that was an email sent to us, Kim, and if we could put that out for the public, I think it's important for us, for them to see. Uh, Power School isn't cheap, it's $106,000, uh, Grantwood AEA, and uh, the increases over time have, have been, uh, would Stark be fair assessment? Craig? Yeah, okay, uh, we'll say that. Uh, and a uh, couple of other things. Uh, we had some uh, repair services coming to us from uh, Des Moines. There was, uh, we were getting double billed for transportation. We've been able to get a credit on that. And uh, that I think that's something we'll take up in operations at some time, uh, you know, trying to, uh, as much as possible, utilize, utilize local vendors and local businesses so we don't incur these uh, travel costs. But uh, other than that, there was no other concerns with uh, the bills for this time. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And on the, as far as the consent agenda, I would like to pull items uh, 11 and uh, 17. Any other items to pull? I move that we approve the consent agenda minus items 11 and 17. I second. Sorry. Second. Okay, I'm ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. We'll move to uh, pulled consent item number 11. Yes, uh, item 11 is the uh, purchase of the uh, weight equipment for West High. And uh, I compared it with uh, what we did at Liberty. Uh, and uh, I think at a time 
when we are uh, experiencing uh, tight uh, funding. Um, uh, I think that this is uh, uh, extravagant and I uh, would like to see, uh, I, I'm, I'm heartened by the boosters contributing. Um, I know I bored everybody with my own personal things. Uh, uh, my school experiences with, with uh, funding uh, this type of uh, equipment at, at uh, my school 100 years ago. But, uh, um, you know, 50,000 from the boosters is great, but uh, at a time when uh, we have other needs as well with Pebble funding, um, uh, I think that uh, I will be voting no on it uh, because I, don't, I think that uh, we've started, we have started an arms race with uh, sports facilities that uh, we can't afford to maintain. Other comments, questions? I just want to ask, does, is there any comments that you'd like to make on that? Good afternoon. Greg Schultz, principal of West High School. I'll just uh, add a couple of things. That I was too also skeptical of uh, why we would need you know this much uh, money for equipment, and I uh, take to heart the fact that we have a, a duty to make sure that we're going to spend it really well. Um, so we have weights. Why do we need more weights? Well, the weights that we have are 30 years old. Well, they don't, and they've been in a uh, they're a, they're non-covered weights, and they're uh, in a on an air conditioned environment. So what happened is they've deteriorated over the time and they're rusty and they are a uh, hazard for um, injuries to fingers as you're putting them on. So the new weights will be covered and, and coated in a way that's much better for students. And uh, so, you know, I looked into this very closely to think, why do we need all the stuff on this list? And if you look through, really it's, it's because we are trying to teach a class, you know, a PE class is the, uh, the right way. Um, and I'm really happy to say that um, Erica Munt will be running these classes and she's our PE teacher of the National PE Teacher of the Year this year. And uh, she does an extraordinary job. And I invite any one of you to watch her sometime in action. Um, she also does the weight room at, uh, at Liberty High School. And uh, because she's, we have her both places this year. Um, and so she's learned from there uh, what they put in, um, exactly how we want to do ours. And uh, I don't think it's extravagant to just outfit a weight room with racks and weights, which essentially if you go through there, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, there are a couple of things that may be extra, but that's why we're raising $50,000 from our boosters to, to cover those costs. So I guess I would just put out there that um, what we're doing is the standard for PE education across the land. Um, I do appreciate the, that we don't want to get into an arms race to keep up with Waukee or West Des Moines or things like that. Um, but that's not why we're doing it. Um, we're outfitting this. We're changing the weight room from a second story unair conditioned space to a, f a first story uh, air space that will be air conditioned and will be appropriate for our, the size of our school and the size of our classes. We'll be able to run 60 students in that at a time. And you know we, we try to keep uh, classes smaller, but we're not able to keep our PE classes under 30 ever. So um, it's the appropriate thing to do. Great, what's, or Dwayne, what's the life cycle on this? No, we, our previous weight equipment's been around for 30 years. This ought to last at least 30 years, given the fact that it's better equipment and it's an air-conditioned environment. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't want anybody to break a sweat in the weight room, so I think it's important that that be air-conditioned. They'll and, be sweating uh, plenty. What? They'll be sweating plenty. Well, yeah, in the air-conditioning, I'm sure that uh, we'll turn it down. Uh, but uh, um, uh, painting cast iron, we, we, we can't master that. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, if the if the, uh, have the old weights gotten lighter, uh, the paint the paint loss. In some um, cases, they've broken in half completely. Well, if if they're broken, we replace them, just like we would replace anything. Uh, but uh, uh, Jim Wooden, uh, Hall of Fame basketball coach, uh, his players uh, practice with bricks. Uh, 
and he was able to win national championships with those things. And I think uh, comparing ourselves to uh, Division I schools as a rationale for this uh, expenditure uh, when we, uh, we have other needs for Pebble funding. So, uh, but uh, I, uh, like I've made my uh, opposition known, so. Called IEI. I, I uh, move that uh, item 11. Yeah, I think you can make the move if, you, if you're going to vote against it, so I'll, I'll make the motion. Sure, go ahead. I'm, I move that we approve the uh, quotes from Powerlift to purchase strength, strength equipment and accessories for West High. I second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Rotland, Ressler, Godwin, Clausen, Malone, and Eyestone voting yay and Director Hemingway voting nay. Kim, uh, number 17 from consent agenda. Yes, number 17 uh, and I would uh, echo the uh, questions made uh, by the community commenter uh, and uh, ask staff to address the questions that were raised. I think some of those questions were answered in the email that Lori asked, I would assume. Did the public get, get a chance to look at the email? I doubt it. I doubt they it. haven't, I but if they, need, if they would need the answers, I don't know that it's anything that would be. Well, I, I too, sh I too uh, uh, have concerns for spending this money now uh, on the RAM model when uh, uh, I don't know that, uh, that it has proven itself to be uh, working, uh, working as best as, it, it, as uh, anticipated. And uh, especially at a newly renovated school that we're doing this when we're putting off other construction at other spots, or may put off construction at other spots. And, and uh, uh, 43,000 design cost uh, is not... Uh, insignificant and uh, I think that we would be we it would do us well to uh, put this off and uh, discuss this further before we go forward with it um, I'd just like to weigh in that we did as a board at work sessions as we're talking about um, looking at boundaries and redistricting and all that and, and Twain was a pretty big piece of that conversation and as I recall from our our last work session on it, you know, I think there was, you know, kind of across the board some disappointment that we couldn't do some immediate changes um, without really causing a lot of upheaval. I know I personally felt like we were trying to target that as something we could uh, um, address immediately, and it just wasn't wasn't the case. Um, I think that we, as we've gone through this conversation, we were looking at short term, medium term, you know, mid term and long term solutions to really balance things and, you know, address some of these issues at our various schools. And I, I would agree that we don't know that RAM is the be all end all of things. I think I still think it's a good idea. And I think that we're not stopping it next year, um, you know, whether we know that it's working or not. I think we're giving it time to see if it is working. And if we're not going to change boundaries, you know, for a school year that's six months away, like something needs to be done short term. And I would totally agree that this addition to Twain is not the long term solution, but it is a short term solution granted for a problem that maybe we have created ourselves, but the kids are where they're at, and you know, I, I guess I would prefer to um, do the best we can in the short term to make their learning environments better, so. Duane, I have a couple comments. As um, I think about 
the boundary work and the discussions that we're undertaking in terms of paired schools and things, um, one thought that comes to mind is what is Twain going to be used for? What, it's gonna, what is it going to look like in three years um, when we make these changes? And I'm wondering if, and perhaps you already are planning on doing this, but um, when you get your uh, design work done, could, could you ask to have the, uh, the one classroom enclosure done separately from the, um, in two separate proposals. Um, three classrooms versus one classroom versus two classrooms. Um, I'd like to just see, what I'm thinking about is if Twain's gonna change in purpose, I wanna make sure that um, the rooms that we put in now can be used no matter what Twain looks like in three years. Um, for example, if it was a, um, three through six building. Could we make it a room that could be used for either pre-K, in case it's a K through two building, or a science lab for a three through six um, classroom? Um, Pre-K is pretty defined, I know, um, and it says on the addition, it's titled Pre-K Classroom Edition, and you know I love pre-K. Um, I'm all for pre-K, but, um, I just want to make sure that whatever we put in is going to be, um, we're going to be able to make the most use of it when we decide what we're doing with the well, building. Well, I, I can't speak to the long-term use. I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not involved in the educational programming of buildings, but I would say this to you. Our initial plan for that single classroom was to, to design it right at 1,000 square feet because we can put a second exit door into the courtyard. So that meets the requirements of that. If you choose to use it that way, you could. If you choose to use it as a second music room or a classroom, you could. It'd be right next to the existing music room. Uh, so there are a lot, of, a lot of different uses for that room. It's also adjacent to a tunnel in the existing building, so we can run, easily run plumbing to that space if we need to. We've thought about that. In terms of the one classroom versus the three, we can certainly design them. There'll be separate designs, and we can bid out one or bid out three or bid out two or whatever choice you make at the time. Currently, that the proposal is to design one. If we want to go to two, there's an additional fee involved, but I think it's stated in that proposal someplace that we could do that. So, I, you know, there, I think in the two that we would add, certainly add on to the south end of the building, there would be typical classrooms that could be used for any purpose. So the design work we're requesting right now is just for the closure, enclosure, the one pre-K yes. classroom? Yes. Okay. And, and the reason I had the discussion with the architect is there's ongoing discussions in our administrative staff as to how many classrooms we actually may need, and I don't think that's been determined yet. I see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Amy, can you just touch on, um, so currently they have a portable outside for special education? Actually, we've repurposed that, and we've brought that room inside. Inside, right. And use that more for office space. I think the instructional coach is now outside. And then in the library, there was room created. They yeah take away a reading area and created what? Yeah, so I'll just back up a little bit. Over the course of last year, when we knew that there was gonna be an additional FTE over the summer, we worked to build some space, so we repurposed um, a spot in the library, displaced the ELL teachers out of a typical size classroom, and they are now serving student, ELL students in the library. It's a nice space that was built in there. Um, then over the fall, when we saw numbers continue to increase, uh, we added an FTE and knew that our only existing classroom space still yet available was um, housing three reading teachers. And so those walls that have been built within the library are um, much more temporary and not super conducive to learning in that setting, but that was um, our way that we were able to add that classroom space. Uh, Mid-year then, we added a strat two special education teacher and thought that we would be able to utilize the small portable that we brought over from Wood Elementary and um, a month or two into it, we determined that that was not the, the best use of that space. We brought that um, classroom inside, and like I said, shared, uh, shared recently that we uh, had the instructional coach, coach go out. So space is truly a premium. I mean, you saw the different things that we could consider doing. Um, you know, that the numbers are a little bit of a moving target right now with our homeless uh, students that are there. We know that um, under McKinney-Vento, uh, they have the right to stay there for the remainder of this year. We do not know um, how many will take up permanent residence and, and move over to their new school. So there's a variable. Kindergarten across the district, of course, is a variable that we don't know exactly where numbers are going to settle. 
Um, in our projections, we have three kindergarten teachers listed there because that's typically what we've been seeing. Twain tends to grow over the summer. We tend to not get the registration that we do in the springtime like we see in some of our other buildings. And I was, um, you know, looking back to see, you know, how, how big has Twain been in the recent years? And we were as high as 300 or 378 students there, and that would have been the year prior to um, opening Alexander. So we're not quite there yet, but I'm assuming at that time we probably had um, some modulars there, and I get the optics of that having had the, gone through the renovations. Um, that, that's just where we're at. The other key piece is not only having the kids um, come back from the shelters, it's just that turnover rate now going from 90 days to 45 days. So um, that means that more kids are coming into the building, and with the McKinney-Vento Act, more kids are getting to stay as well. So, and I might, I might add, that the other part of our debate internally is, you know, we could put a modular there, but it would cost in excess of $100,000, and it might be better spent on the physical building itself. And the other debate we're having in-house, to answer part of your earlier question, is which, which is going to be the most cost-effective to build, the one interior classroom in the courtyard or a two-classroom addition? Right now, I would tell you, because of the structure, I think the one classroom would be, because three of the exterior walls are already in place. I just have to add a fourth wall, a roof, and a floor. So I think we can do it cost-effectively, whereas the two-story or two-classroom addition would be the entire structure. So those are the other, other discussions that we're having in-house. I move that we approve the design work contract for Twain Elementary. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Rotland, Ressler, Godwin, Clausen, Malone, and I Stone voting yay and director Hemingway voting nay. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple public hearings this evening. The first is um, uh, on the district's proposed fiscal year 2019 certified budget and setting the tax rate. Now is the time and place for the public hearing on the district's proposed fiscal year 2019 certified budget and setting the tax rate. The board of directors set the date for this public hearing on March 27th, 2018. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on March 29, 2018. Are there any questions from the board related to the certified budget and setting the tax rate? Are there any questions from the public related to the certified budget and setting the tax rate? I declare this public hearing closed. Next up is the public hearing on Mann Elementary School renovation and addition. Now is the time and place for the public hearing on the proposed plans and specifications for the Mann Elementary School renovation and addition project. The Board of Directors set the date for this public hearing on February 27, 2018. Notice of public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on February 28, 2018. The district will receive bids on this project at 2 p.m. on April 12, 2018 at the Educational Services Center located at 1725 North Dodge Street, Iowa City, Iowa 52245. Notice to contractors was published as required by law in multiple statewide plan rooms and on the Iowa City Community School District website on February 28, 2018. Are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Declare this public hearing closed. Thank you. Um, now we'll move into the presentation portion of the agenda. And our first topic is the equity committee update on objective three achievement. Hello everybody, and um, again, thank you for having us over tonight. I'm here with some fellow members of the Equity Committee. We have some others in the audience. And tonight we're here happy to present our second uh, presentation, the second update. This time we're gonna be focusing on a particular, in particularly on objective three within the comprehensive e equity plan on the slides CEP 
it will, on, and during our presentation that stands for Comprehensive Equity Plan, uh, particularly in reducing disproportionality in achievement. Um, our committee during our meetings and our yearly retreats, we have looked a lot at, at a lot of data over the past year, including data from FAST assessments, which is a reading assessment, and student achievement on the Iowa assessments. Um, today, we would like to talk to you about three key points that we would like to share with you on, about how to lead district improvements in achievement disparities. Okay. First, it's the idea that looking at data through an equity, equity lens is critically important. Second, we want to share an example of one of the several data that we have, data sets that we have been looking at. And third, having spent a lot of time looking at this data, we, we are looking forward to understanding the var varying things that can be done to overcome disparities. In the spirit of offering equity uh, committee support to the board, we have different members here tonight who will be giving just a little bit more detail on each of the points that we're making. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Charlie Easton, I'm a member of the Equity Committee. Uh, first of all, uh, tonight we're going to ask you to, to, uh, to look at data through an equity lens or to begin looking at data through an equity lens. I know we've started that process and you'll probably get tired of us telling you that they're suggesting to you that we should continue that process. Uh, <clears throat> the primarily, looking at data through an equ equity lens means asking for disaggregated data. Whenever we receive data in any form, asking it that it be disaggregated so we can look at racial disparities, ethnic disparities, and other protected class disparities. And then asking questions about the data. This is something the district's gotten much better about over the past few years. And we realize it takes some time to manage all of the data requests that the staff receives uh, uh, from you and from us and from other sources too. And we appreciate, as, and as we believe you do though, that it's very difficult to improve things that we don't attend to. We are hopeful that our attention to data as a committee and your attention to data as a board will help us, the district to understand what matters and what improvements we hope to see in the support over time. The other key point about looking at data through an equity lens is that we have to be careful. What we are learning about implicit bias tells us that the images we are about to share with you, the images that you have been viewing over the past years can contribute to our unconscious, sens unconscious sensibilities about the potential of our students of color. The more we see data around the achievement gap, the more it can reinforce an implicit bias about students of color being less successful in schools and all the stories that come with that. And the, one of the purposes of the slide that's before you now is to, to show the inset uh, label proficiency rates 2016. We believe it's important to share this image in this slide as we talk about data. These data are from several schools in another Iowa school district. Here you see African American, Hispanic, and white students performing at nearly the same levels in that particular district. It is possible for students of color to achieve at high levels, and it is very important we keep this image in our mind's eye as we go forward. This provides a counter story or counter, counter stereotype about students of color, which is part of the implicit bias tr uh, training that's occurring in the district now. Yeah, Charlie, could you share with us what just what what specific district this is that you gave us the data from? I think it's from Des Moines, Phil. I'm <clears throat> the second, this next slide shows uh, 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 an opportunity for us to look at some data. After a recent data presentation a few uh, weeks ago, a school board member asked to see the achievement of students over time, which is the left-hand line chart. Diane Schumacher, thank you Diane, attended our last equity committee meeting and it shared a number of charts with us. We're looking at tonight and a representative sample. We appreciate, we're very appreciative of Diane's willingness and ability to take a magnifying glass to these data. In this example chart, we see the performance of one class of students, the class of 2022, 
as they progress from the third grade through the eighth, uh, through the, uh, eighth grade. The gold line shows the performance of black students. The yellow line represents Hispanic students. The red line represents white students and the blue line represents Asian students. The first dot on the line represents <clears throat> the class's average reading scores which, when they were in third grade, which was in school year 2012 through 13. These are average reading scores again on this, uh, this line. The second dot of the line, which in all cases is higher, shows the class's average reading scores when they were in fourth grade in 2013 and 14, and so on <clears throat> from left to right on the chart. As noted, this chart shows that all students do increase in proficiency or average or the average scores for that for the grade does increase over time in the uh, you know, this reading assessment assessment. <clears throat> what appears evident in this line chart, though, is that the difference between subgroups of students subgroups of students appears to be growing over time. Putting the same data into a different visualization is uh, you can look at the second chart, the bar chart, with the green and purple bars. This chart illustrates the size of the gap in average scores between white and black students in green and white and Hispanic students in purple. Here, it's much easier to see that the gap between students also increases over time from a gap between average white and black students' scores in 2012-13 being just about 26 points to the gap being more than 56 points in 2017 and 18. This shows us that while students are learning across the district, the rates at which students are learning over time is disproportionate. Something is happening the longer students are in our building. The second chart, the bar charts, also show, shows that in the third grade, the gap in average scores between students is surprisingly close to what it should be, that is zero. Now there's no doubt that these data are complicated, they represent a complicated situation, and this is just a rough view of the, the data. We share these data with you tonight to provide an example of how we can dig into the data and ask additional questions. The questions allow a much richer investigation into the root causes of achievement disparities in the district, as well as different solutions to formulate and implement. This is the sort of thing we can be looking at to, uh, as we try to better understand where to invest our time and resources. Hello everybody, my name is Saria, just like Sarah is and I. Uh, I have three daughters in the Iowa City Community, Community School District. I am an immigrant as well. Uh, I'm going to take, off, take over from my colleague Charlie and confirm to you that our investigation into achievement disparities is hardly complete. We have appreciated receiving data from administrators and talking with them about the data. We acknowledge these conversations can be very difficult. We encourage you as a board to continue to have these conversations and to expect that they are taking place between your meetings, which we understand they are. You also need to make sure the work moves beyond just admiring the problem to borrow a phrase from Diane Schumacher and others. The point of looking at these data is not to get depressed. The point is to use the data to solve the problems, to identify new findings and patterns, and to ask new questions. Because those findings can send us into, into series of analysis that can lead to effective action. It is important to continue to dig into the kinds of questions that ultimately flesh out an action plan. What are the problems we want to resolve? What are the root causes of those problems? What can we do to address those root causes? How quickly can we expect to eliminate the problems? What supports and pressures can we offer to ensure that tough problems are addressed? We know there are people asking these questions. The Equity Committee certainly will continue to ask them. We urge you to think about these questions as part of the process of achieving your systematic goals. So, as we move toward a more focused look both at our disparities and at what we can do to overcome disparities, we have two key, key takeaways. First, achievement gaps by race, ethnicity are not inevitable. We have examples of schools and districts where achievement gaps have been eliminated, but they are persistent. 
This is not easy work, but it can be joyful. Second, the comprehensive equity plan is a powerful tool. You have to help lead the district to equitable outcomes. Through the CEP, you can be clear what our system goals are, how we will measure progress. toward the goals and what supports and intervention can be used to help achieve our mutual goals. So, as far next steps, we look forward to working in partnership in ever more effective ways to achieve the results we all want. As we recommended last month, when we gave our update on staff diversity, updating the comprehensive equity plan is a key strategy toward achieving your strategic goals. We also believe that updating the comprehensive equity plan is an important way to demonstrate to the community the district's commitments and seriousness of purpose. We stand ready to support that process. Thank you. Comments? Thank yeah. you. Comments from the board? Questions? Um, I have, a, I guess this would be a question for uh, Amy. Um, do we have the Iowa assessment and the FAST test uh, in a disaggregated data form? Okay. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay, and has that been shared with uh, the public and everything that way? So in January, Diane provided a report to the board around IO assessments from our fall data. That uh, definitely was disaggregated. And then in our October annual report to the board, that's always been disaggregated the last few years at least. Um, with FAST assessments, the one group that we were able to pull out of Iowa tier that we cannot pull out of FAST bridge is ELL and FRL, so the free and reduced lunch price status students. Okay, that's just, so just FRL and ELL, but the, the other data can be uh, disaggregated yeah. and, and broken out. And we don't have anything uh, from a winter test yet? For fast. It, yes. Yep, that was shared Does with the board last week. Right, okay, and that was dis dis disaggregated and everything? Was not, it was disaggregated by grade, but it was not, um, and by building, but not into race or ethnic groups. Why was that? Um, nobody asked for it that way. Can I, can I assume that you'll take this as I'm asking for it and yep. we get it? I got your email. Yep. Okay, thank you. And when, when we do, that we can share that with the public, like uh, the email on Twain. I don't know. I think the answer to this is no. Is there any way to disaggregate mobility? I mean, can we pull out kids who have been in the district for 10 years as opposed to one? Is that? Or, or the number of school changes they make in their, you know. I know we do track mobility as a general construct, but we don't pull out test data by okay. mobility. Is it? possible and I'm not asking you to do it I'm just wondering I, and I don't can't imagine how it would be but right the only way we used to be able to and we still can to some extent is pull out it by those students who weren't here a full academic year okay. so we have students who've been here at least a year more or less than a year and we can remove the kids who've been here less than a year um, the problem with that is we can't do that in a timely manner we have to kind of wait for the state to upload all the data and to get it through a system and then get it to us so by the time they do that it's usually a good six months old so we, we, be, we like to try to look at the data as quickly as we can and that would be just kids if they haven't been here a full year right so outside of two years five years ten okay right I want to thank the Equity Committee for the presentation tonight. The powerful messages for me are don't just admire the problem. It's, you know, looking at the data is interesting, but if you just look at it and don't do anything about it, it actually is a further detriment um, to the goals that we have. Um, I think you also made some very powerful proposals around understanding what problem we're trying to solve. Um, based on that problem, doing the root cause analysis and then putting action plans in place and then once those plans are implemented, coming back and measuring, were they successful? It's an ongoing cycle of measurement, uh, problem identification, root cause analysis, testing a solution and measuring it and going back again because as we know, the solutions to equity disparities in our district is not a single solution. If there were one, we would have already done it. There's got a lot, a lot of factors, a lot, a lot of things that we need to, to cover. 
I think uh, another powerful uh, moment was the, the disparity grows uh, as the students stay in the district longer. And for me, that means early um, you know, elementary level intervention, whatever that would look like, feels like something might be an area worthy of prioritizing. I know we've started that with RAM and there may be other things that we can do, but um, I'm hoping and would be asking the board as we think about, as we want to establish our goals for the next school year, using some of this disaggregated data, perhaps working with the equity committee to help us come up with some priorities. Again, we're gonna to have to start somewhere, see if we can put something in place and, 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 and see if that solution's making um, the impact that we want it to. But I think as we get into this goal setting process, understanding the data and helping you helping us identify priorities where we can focus our effort next year would be really, really helpful. Um, because again, it's a big, big problem and we want to make sure that we're focusing our energy where we think there's the highest potential return and, and, and growth. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there, using this data for setting our goals and really tracking our action plans throughout the year to see if we are able to make a difference. The other thing is too, um, we're seeing this with RAM. We have one year of RAM data. We'll get you know the results from this school year. It sometimes takes time, multiple years, to actually see if um, the solutions we're putting into place is having the impact that we would like. So this is an ongoing journey, but one that's really, really, really important for our district, for our students, for our families. So I really appreciate very much the work that you're doing and what you presented tonight. And I wanna use, I wanna, I wanna use what you're presenting to help us set goals and priorities and actions for the district. And we certainly appreciate you having us here. This discussion in particular, keeping in mind that whenever we're presenting data, we try as much as we can to present it, look at it in different ways, look at it, ask for disproportionality questions. Okay, are they, are, is the data desegregated? Is it not? Why is it not? And this will help us move forward and find better solutions for our district. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, the next presentation is on Reach for Your Potential. Hi, good evening. I'm Carol Bonesack. I'm the executive officer of the Greater Iowa City Area Home Builders Association. Thank you for letting us come in and uh, give you a presentation on what we're going to be doing this summer with the students uh, in the several school districts. One of them will be the Iowa City Community School District. Uh, with us this evening is, um, let's see if I can, some of the members of the Greater Iowa City Area Home Builders Association. We have uh, Tim Ruth, he's with McCready Ruth Construction. He is past president of the Home Builders Association of Iowa City, as well as the Home Builders Association of the State of Iowa, and uh, chair of our Vocational Training Council. Also is Brad Hauser, he's with Sycamore Developments. Uh, he was also uh, past president of the Student Built House Program that used to be in the Iowa City Community School District that hasn't been in place since June of 2010. Uh, was the last time we had a school district uh, student built house. And then also uh, Joe Greathouse, he's with Kirkwood Community College, and then Ron Schieffer with Reach for Your Potential. So we'll start with, we'll just go ahead and let the guys. <laughs> well, greetings. I'm Tim Ruth, and kind of, you can see from our drawings, we're kind of been spearheading this. Uh, we're great friends with Reach for Your Potential. This house will serve a, a great many needs, as Ron will explain to you. But the need it will probably satisfy more than any is the need for skilled trades, skilled labor. Um, we're in extreme shortage because of the idea that a four-year college degree is an advantage to someone. Um, I'm a great believer in students and teaching. We currently have uh, three, or four, three or four, it varies, students from Kirkwood on our staff. Um, the majority of our employees are Kirkwood graduates or Kirkwood students, and I believe in training, And because if, if we don't train, we won't have someone to replace us if we would ever possibly want to retire. So with that said, I'm very excited about this project. It will be able to bring students, trade people together to do something that we all should do, and that's give to our community, to people that don't have a great chance. So. Thank you for considering this, and uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Brad Hauser. I just wanted to also thank everybody for taking the opportunity to allow us to participate with this program. Being a past president of it, I was always an advocate for this program when Bob Statlander ran it for the school system. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us as developers to participate and help the students as well as the Kirkwood students, you know, grow and be able to find positions within the community after they graduate. So I just wanted to thank you. Good evening, guys. I'm Joe Greathouse from Kirkwood. I teach construction management to our uh, first uh, one-year and two-year programs there at Kirkwood. Uh, Kirkwood is happy to be involved and in, in a participant in this project, as has been said already, uh, from the aspect of training our future uh, skilled trade uh, employees. As you know, there is, as Tim said, a huge uh, disparity in the amount of people interested in those careers and the preparedness that we offer them. So. Also, as Brad mentioned, a uh, longtime teacher here at uh, Iowa City, uh, Bob Statlander, who ran the program for many, many years. Uh, I was actually one of Bob's teacher associates way back when, when I first started teaching. So for me, it's nice to see this come full circle and offer this program again to Iowa City uh, area students. So as, as Kirkwood's role in this, uh, we will um, offer the students who participate internship credit college credit towards uh, hopefully a, a future career in the, in the building trades. Be a two credit hour course. Uh, the students uh, will have <clears throat> uh, members from the association as well as other community members help sponsor their tuition payments. Now, the real interesting thing uh, in my um, view of this is the students will not only dedicate hours at the house, but the employers who are sponsoring them and who are working with them with the internship will keep them on uh, throughout the summer and potentially as part-time and full-time employment thereafter. So excited about that possibility, excited to see this again come full circle for your students. And also, by the way, can't forget to mention the excitement that we see with the ACE program at City, at West, Liberty, and, and Tate. So kudos on that. Thank you. And uh, before you uh, sit down, uh, so as I understand you correctly, there's no cost to the students that, yeah. that take the course. That's right. We're going to try to do our best to fund. We, we plan. We are saying, yes, we will provide scholarship money for that tuition. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Welcome. And it'll happen during the summer months, so they won't be. Uh, no, I, I think this is, this, is, cool. this is such a success on so many levels and in the summer and the typical building season and, and offering it, it'll be open to more students that have a full schedule and everything. Mm -hmm. so absolutely. I think it's great. Thanks. Hi. I'm Ron Schieffer from uh, Reach for Your Potential, Executive Director of Reach for Your Potential. I uh, started the agency about 30 years ago and uh, started with one group home in town here and now we've grown to roughly 30 homes, half which are wheelchair accessible homes and around 20 apartments. And um, there's always a need, we always have a need for uh, accessible homes, which this would be. Um, uh, of the 30 homes that we have, uh, about 15 of those are accessible and we never have um, problems filling those homes. Um, any questions from me? I can't think of anything, well, um, but um, just thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I, I, I would like to thank uh, uh, Tim uh, also for all your help with us on the ACE program at, at City High. Uh, that ran into some snags and, and uh, it seems like we're getting that ba back on course. And uh, uh, this is something I know Paul's been a, a big uh, uh, advocate for this as well for uh, the home building program and uh, ours was uh, eliminated in its 39th year, so uh, I think if we wanted to, we could say that this is the 40th one. Uh, numbers are significant uh, that way, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, tickled to hear that uh, the students that take it will uh, not be incurring any fees on their own part uh, that way, and, and we have our students going to the uh, steam fitters uh, facility up in uh, Cedar Rapids on Thursday. And that'll be a great opportunity to, on the bus ride up to Cedar Rapids, uh, let everybody know about this program and, and that. And, and I know Brady, this is nodding his head, he's gonna shake, he's gonna help us get the word out on this. And, 
And uh, if the numbers that, uh, in the ACE program are uh, uh, reflective of what it is at other schools, I mean, we've got uh, historic numbers involved with that. So I think this is, this is really gonna take off and go. And I just wanna thank the Home Builders Association. I know uh, they put in a lot of work on this and, and uh, there were some, you know, uh, this, is, this is just a phenomenal thing for the community and, and I just wanna thank you guys uh, so much for the work that you put in and, and making this happen. And I apologize to Brad, uh, uh, old weightlifting buddy that he had to come in on a night when I was the one that was supposed to say no to uh, that I know in our younger days that probably a conversation wouldn't happen, but uh. I do have a question actually as I was listening to Phil talk um, You had mentioned that the last time we had a student built home was in June 2010 and we're bringing it back this summer of 2018 is this is our intention to do this on an annual basis or is this a one time? I'm just curious. Oh <laughs> So really we would love for this to continue every year in the in the old days, <laughs> back in uh, June of 2010, the house was built and it was for sale. And so the house was sold and then the profit was used to fund the next year's home and pay for, Brad would be able to give a much better uh, description of how the program worked. Uh, the money paid for the instructor, it paid for the subcontractors, the, the instructor was the general contractor and Go ahead and come on up. <laughs> the program was set up originally so the kids did the work. Mm -hmm. That was the real focus of it. It ended up growing into a little bit more than that where one of the, one of the downfalls for you know, about the middle of the program was the houses got so big the kids weren't doing the work. And I think that's a key with this program is the kids are doing the work and they're learning on hands versus <clears throat> the subs coming in and showing them and them doing all the work and all they're doing is seeing it. So I think that's a key component. We changed that program at the end and it was really a big benefit. We made the houses a little simpler. We worked with uh, Greater Iowa City Housing. They bought a lot of the homes at the end and so it went into the community that way. So it was just it was really good and I think the combination of this program is, is the benefit of what we learned out of the old program. Mm -hmm. Good. And this house will have a, uh, because it is so specialized um, for the wheelchair accessibility, <coughs> there will be a lot of subs, um, but the students will just have that much more to learn uh, about <coughs> aging in place. Uh, uh, we will have, uh, Tim just, we have certified aging in place specialists that will be working on this house. It will be visitable as well as livable. Um, and so <coughs> the hope is to get the program it won't be the way it was when it was during the school year and with uh, uh, the students working with the teacher during the school year, but it'll be a summer project. But to go back to a house where it's more built by the students, very hands-on, mm -hmm. and then resold into the community and where it's sustainable and can, mm -hmm. can continue on from year to year. A question, are there any requirements or prereqs that students who wanna take part in this program have to meet in order to take part in this program, or is it open to any and every student that hears about this program? I do believe they'll need to be 16 or older, Joe, mm -hmm. yes, uh, just for liability purposes. So really it'll basically be um, some sophomores, mostly juniors and seniors. Uh, there has been talk about the students taking uh, the 10-hour OSHA class the first week before mm -hmm. uh, they start working, definitely training, safety training before they start. There will be forms. Uh, liability forms for the students and the parents uh, or um, uh, their caregiver to their person in charge to, to fill out before they can start taking the class but otherwise no yeah. it'll be open to to all students that want to work on the house and learn a trade mm -hmm. learn the uh, learn a skill That's great. is there a cap on the number of students I know we've talked about a minimum number of students that we need to uh, build the house, but. There'll be work for people to do. We're gonna get Joe up here. <laughs> sure. So the, the question again was how many, what's the maximum number of students? Mm -hmm. um, really that comes down to faculty in this case, so okay. overseeing that. Uh, in similar projects, we've had up to 24 students. Uh, summer of 2015, we did a similar project with Clear Creek Manor the STEM Center project with them, and there were 24 students there. <clears throat> Our minimum is 12, and that's just an enrollment number, that, target that Kirkwood has to have, but. 
So we, I, I think we anticipate 12 to 24. Okay. That's going to target. Thanks. Yep. I just want to Please, add one yeah. thing that kind of got missed on this, and that is that Brad called it to my attention. One thing that this also opens up special, uh, someone in a, a very handicapped capacity could find a career here because we have a lot of people that do design, do, you know, whether we use CAD, Revit, uh, whatever. And that person could be enthused in, by, the, by living in the home and possibly want to pursue a career in designing homes. Because, you know, the most exciting thing about this will be the people that live there. Mm -hmm. It's not doing it. And this first project, is gonna, you're going to see a lot of subcontractors because we got to get people to buy in. And so getting the snowball rolling down the hill is all what we're trying to do this year. We have Ron, who's a very gracious person to work with, and we'll buy the house. And we have Carol and Joe, and we'll get it all. And Brad, we've got a great team, and it's going to work well. Thank you. So just for clarification, so a student with disability that would maybe need um, a job coach with them. Yeah. There's some, that's come. somebody they that could, come. okay, great. We're going we're gonna to make, I have a special needs daughter. Yeah. So. We're going to make do whatever we Great. need to do. I used to work for Arkham yeah. Johnson County, so I'm just yeah. thinking about those clients that I used to serve. So we, we, that's we great. We don't care. As long as yeah. you basically got a pulse in your 16. <laughs> <laughs> but no, okay. we, we need help. And yeah. It's a huge undertaking, but we have a very lofty goal. So Yeah. Great. And this is something that um, I, really the, the parents need to know about it. Right. And encourage their, 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 their kids to participate. And so that brings in this next step, saying, promoting this to the guidance counselors, the teachers, and the parents, and the students. That was going to be my question. I know we're kind of wrapping up, but what kind of promotion is being done with the students? And I'm talking about not through their parents, because um, they don't always want to listen to what we have to say or what ideas we have on what classes they should take. What, what's happening during the school day to excite the kids about this, or get them excited about it? Well, I'm at City High pretty frequently uh, in the uh, ACE program with John Reynolds. I have uh, gone up to uh, West High and uh, or up to Liberty High. But once all of the paperwork is in place with Kirkwood, uh, to be handing out, distributing to the kids, taking home, showing it to the parents, getting everything filled out, uh, we'll be in there again. We'll be showing the plans mm -hmm. and have uh, the group talking to the students in each of, well, definitely up at City High at the ACE class. West High, I'm not sure if their class is going on right now where they build the shed. And then Liberty High with Micah up there with his kids. And Matt, I'm going to put you on the spot. But is there anything else we can do to promote this to the kids? I think the, the best thing's just been the experience at uh, the school and at City High, and John's been a great instructor for us, and um, putting that experience together with the ACE program during the school year has been a good thing, and so I think that when you ask about inspiring that interest, I think just like she talked about, I mean, that's the best way to do it, that we have that school year experience and then this opportunity in the summer, so I think it's, a, uh, it's what excited us about the model when we met, I don't know, it was almost two years ago, I think it was like right after when Phil got on the board and they talked about this summer build and uh, starting it with the ACE program and then how that provides a continuum all the way up to the regional center if students want to pursue uh, courses in that ACE track. So uh, we feel really good about it and think just continuing to spread the good news and thank you for all the partnerships. I know we, we wouldn't be providing this opportunity without those community partners. And, and uh, as far as having that information, you know, having your final information or, or that, would you have an idea on time on that? Would, would that be something, because I say, Thursday of next week, uh, we've got uh, students going from City and West up to look at apprenticeship opportunities up in Cedar Rapids, and it's a hour-long bus trip, and it'd be a great time to to give everybody something to read on that, uh, make that trip go a little shorter. So you know, I should have had it done by now, right? <laughs> well, basically, right? so we're kind of behind a little bit on that regard. Really, what as Carol mentioned, we're working through the instructors at the high schools, okay. predominantly looking at the uh, current students in the ACE program. Right. Because they've already self-identified a bit. Exactly. So right. we've got that, that we'll choose from. And I don't anticipate trouble I, with enrollment numbers. I don't either. So, yes, we will get the paperwork together, but I think we're sitting okay. Yeah. And, and uh, would it be okay if we even just, we could present this presentation to them on the, you know, just give them an idea on the going up sure. on the bus that way to spark some interest? 
because we'll have the Brian Martz from West High and, yep. and that with his group. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to the ethnic studies update. The board had asked for um, an update on where we were with our ethnic studies discussion from the time of our last meeting. So just to kind of give you a quick overview, um, last week we had representatives from SAD, from um, the district, um, from the equity committee, and Director Rustling was with us as well. And we met to see what would be some efforts going forward to try to address this. Um, also, we had the social studies coordinator. He submitted a curriculum writing proposal, so Brady Schutz here, and um, he's got a group of teachers who are getting ready to work on writing the curriculum this summer. We had the high school principals identify a teacher in every high school who is interested in teaching the course, so they'll be part of the curriculum writing team this summer. And we plan on having um, representatives from SAD meet with that team early in the summer or right at the end of the school year to share what they their view of what the curriculum could look like. And that was also part of the discussion on Tuesday night, or what are some of the outcomes that we'd like to see in that curriculum? And Miriam, would you feel comfortable going over those? Yeah, of course. Okay, great. So uh, earlier in March, Saad met as a group to discuss what were a few aspects of the course that we saw as crucial in any potential form it might take. So rather than talking about curriculum items or curriculum points, we talked about certain aspects of that any class should have, including what we called these five elements, uh, historic reteaching, current events, individual exploration, community outreach, and having it be discussion-based. And I'll give you a little bit of an overview on each of those. So a historic reteaching was essentially just going into depth on topics that you don't exactly get to delve into in classes that you take. For example, we've talked about AP courses being the only opportunity most students get to go into depth on certain issues that they learn about in school. This class would have a pointed focus on those things. Current events would incorporate a pop culture aspect into whatever was being taught. Individual exploration would be each student would be given the opportunity to pick one topic for research or exploration that they would relay back to the class. Uh, community outreach would be a service aspect or model where students would be going out into the community and applying whatever it was they were learning in the class. And the discussion-based aspect was just having most of this class be talking about what people are learning amongst each other, not just going into a textbook, doing a reading, and coming back with a worksheet. Um, yeah, that was all for now. So the intent, as I said, would be to share these ideas with the curriculum writing team and see what we could incorporate into a course that we would offer, again, in like I said, 1920. Um, so in the meantime, what are some things that we might be able to offer next year? We talked about the, the option of having a PSEO course provided on campus, and some of the, um, I guess, concerns about that, I, I think one of the major concerns was the early hour, having it at zero hour and actually having kids want to get up in the morning and come to school <laughs> a little earlier. Transportation might have been a barrier, and the idea of some kids maybe being a little intimidated by the the concept of taking a college course. So instead of, in lieu of doing that, we have a couple other options that we wanted to present to you. One would be if kids still wanted to do a PSEO option, there are some online courses that address these topics. So I've listed three of them there that are offered in the fall, and there would be more that would be offered next spring. So we could allow students to opt into an online option, which takes away the transportation barrier, takes away the barrier of having to get up early in the morning, um, but still requires a student who's able to access a college course. So we know that still is a barrier for some kids. But then the other option we talked about was creating something along the lines of a lecture series where we could bring topics to the students 
at the buildings and have them participate in learning about a topic and having a discussion about that. So, Kingsley, would you like to talk about that a little bit more? So I passed out information regarding um, potential lecture series. Um, I would ask that if Miriam would like, she can expand upon it. Way to go dodging the question. That was smooth. <laughs> that was real smooth. Share um, leadership. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, immediately after meeting on last Tuesday, Saad once again had a discussion on some potential topics and themes for this lecture series. We talked about in the meeting having them occur possibly once a month, so having nine in a school year at each of the different high schools. And I'm gonna read off some suggested themes that we brainstormed. We had defining civil rights, the role of identity, justice as a subjective, power and privilege, lived experience, thinking globally, feminism, uh, seeing double or how perceptions and biases can shape reality and the impact of language. Now don't those sound interesting? Don't you want to take some of those? Come to our lecture series. <laughs> So that was ultimately, um, again, you've, you've probably seen it in the Press Citizen and other topics. I mean, Dave Gold recently did a Green Room lecture series not too long ago. That was well received. Um, so, you know, that thought went into kind of um, providing this, and it does give a kind of a greater articulation and flexibility with um, not only who can be presenting, but also the material that can be presented as well. Um, the last thing I'll add to this is just some discussion around, that was already mentioned around certification. And so um, because it's only um, going to be one year before we get the class, it, it could potentially be more, but we focused on the 2018-2019 school year. Um, we thought about different things um, like a cord or announcement during graduation. We thought that may be too much, and so we could do a certificate that ultimately students would want to put on their resume or, or talk about and discuss. They could also be part of the presentation. They could be um, individuals that want to present on particular areas, especially around activism or um, gender inequality or their wealth of topics that are there. And so we thought about, you know, making a more of a collaborative process where students could engage but also um, use um, a lot of our resources within the community to um, engage in some of these topics. Questions? Can we talk about how you envision a lecture series being ran? Would that be something that um, it would be during the actual class time or, you, or, or school day, or are you thinking after school? Just because I'm thinking about kids that have jobs or other responsibilities in sports. And um, just recently with uh, Terrence Roberts being brought in and having that discussion with, I know, City High students doing a period actually touched a lot of kids, mine included, that sometimes wouldn't want to or have the ability to to attend after school and just the impact that had on her in particular by being able to attend during the day. So we talked about it briefly and by no means do we have a kind of final set schedule as it relates to that. I think general consensus was conversation around Thursday early outs um, because that would be a difference within the schedule where if you work at four o'clock every single day, um, you have that opportunity in between time to attend that lecture series. Um, but again, we haven't, that was general consensus at the time, doesn't mean that it'll have to be during that time frame right now. I just comment, um, thank you to the group that did this, Paul and the rest of you, thanks to Saad. Uh, I think the way this has gone has been bumpy, but I really like the result. I think that this is a really great collaboration and I think it's, um, Exciting to see that we can go from that bumpiness to, to something that feels more solid um, and hopefully is going to make a big difference in the district. So, Thank you. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to... Oh, there's more. Sorry. Good, yeah. Mm -hmm. on board docs as well. Um, it just has information related to 
emails. There was a lot of concerns around um, when certain emails were certain certain times on the February 26th date. And so you'll see times associated with those, that correspondence. Um, I will I'm be honest with you, I had an opportunity to talk with the students right after our last, was it after our last board meeting? Okay, after our last board meeting. Uh, it was a good opportunity to kind of express um, some of the things that I don't think I've been able to express um, publicly, but also hear from them clearly their concerns and how we can move forward. And so kudos to them for being engaged, ready to go to work, have that conversation and move the conversation as quickly as possible. And I would tell you I wasn't ready to move the conversation on. I wanted to talk about a lot of stuff, but they did a wonderful job as far as kind of going through that. And again, if you have any questions related to certain pieces, let me know. I didn't know how detailed you wanted the information. It's, it's a lot of emails um, and a lot of discussion, but I tried to give at least a general synopsis of how we've um, gone through this process. I think we started around October, um, it says there, and then all the way to uh, March 1st. Thank you, Kingsley. Appreciate that additional information. And again, thanks to the group, Equity Committee and, and Diane and Saad um, for really making, I think, some significant progress since the last board meeting. So thank you all. And Paul, of course, too, from the board. Um, okay, we're going to move on to the next portion of our uh, new agenda, and that's discussion items. And the first topic is Education Committee Report, JP. Um, yeah, we have, um, I guess the main thing is our uh, the our statement here that we talked about. We had a mm -hmm. great discussion, I think, at our last uh, Ed Committee meeting, and uh, thanks to the students who were there. I think that uh, in many areas this has really helped us, uh, I know me as a board member, kind of really understand how this is impacting our students. Um, and just understanding that, you know, making this statement, um, it, it sends a message, you know, that this is a priority to us, it's important, um, and something that we're gonna um, focus on. Paul, uh, process question, is this something, no, we wouldn't vote on it tonight because it's right. not on the action item agenda, but is this something that we would bring forward to, to act on, to vote on, that we're adopting this um, uh, statement? You're not required to, but you certainly could. Yeah, there was some discussion at the meeting too. We weren't sure what, if we needed to vote or if we just about, I mean, I think voting has a bit of a, a weight to it. Um, and so I would maybe when we're in an agenda setting, we could think about putting this as an action for the next board meeting. Certainly. And next week's Ed Committee meeting is at West High. And topics are? Uh, career technical. Um, and there was one other thing on there. Restorative justice. Restorative justice, yeah. Yes. Good, that'll be a good one. Um, so everyone come, um, that'll be a good conversation. Um, next up, Operations Committee, Sean. All right, so we had uh, two main topics at our operations meeting. Um, the first one, uh, we talked about it a little bit at our last board meeting because it was all about safety and security. Um, and we kind of got to the end game there where we were looking at a task force to look at safety and security and kind of best practices surrounding that. As uh, Paul pointed out that uh, Safety means different things to different people. We want to keep that in mind because a lot of this discussion was kind of centered around that uh, kind of active intruder type thing. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that there's more to it than that. And having just looked at the statement, uh, you know, and what we talked about at the Ed Committee, safety is a bigger thing. So, at, you know, in our next meeting, um, we've been, you know, asked to kind of put together the um, kind of the makeup and the questions that we're gonna want that task force to answer. And I think the main question that they need to answer is, what makes you feel safe? And that's a question that should be asked of everyone, you know, the students, the staff, the parents, you know, everybody else, because trying to answer that question is gonna inform all of the different processes and physical things that you're going to do and all of that. So. That's a, a big question, it's a very open-ended question, I understand that, but uh, we'll get a little more specific on that. The other main topic at the operations meeting was um, our playgrounds, and uh, we kind of targeted the, the conversation as, let's say our end game is to have you know, every playground be this 100% inclusive environment, you know, how do we get from here to there? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of what you know, we just saw from 
our ethnic studies, you know, looking at what are outcomes, then how do we get to those outcomes? So that's kind of how we started the conversation. Um, again, in the end, it kind of is ending with a task force, but that was something that was already being directed. Um, we had already given that uh, to uh, the district to look into that and create a team. And I think some emails have gone out uh, already looking for membership in that, I believe. Um, it's already been created. Right. So. Um, that's kind of some next steps, but I think it really is, we, there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, physically what do you want to see, and then how do you fund it, because there's a lot of different things we can do, um, both as a district and then looking outside to external sources and really figuring out how to get to a place where we're all happy with every facility that we have, right? And I think we've got a long way to get there, um, but to um, not take the starting steps, we'll never get there. So I think that was the kind of the point. Um, our next meeting, um, we're going to obviously talk about the safety and security task force a little bit. Um, and I believe we throw out uh, a couple different uh, things, topics, and we haven't landed. I think we'll probably pick two, but we talked about the IPM, integrated pest management, um, just some operational efficiencies, because we're all talking about that with how we're looking at boundaries and things, um, just the templates of our schools, and as uh, Phil mentioned earlier, kind of local preference on bidding and things like that. So probably pick out a couple of those topics at our next meeting, which is May 1st, I believe. Yeah. And you'll probably Sorry. have to stick to a couple because that's policy and governance meeting too. All right. <laughs> I, I like it if you can kick me out so I don't just keep talking. Uh, this kind of fits into what you were talking about, but uh, maybe Steve, it'd be a good time just to publicly announce some people maybe who haven't read their email that there is Alice training going on that you can sign up for. April 21st, uh, there'll be a session at each of the three high schools. We've been working in coordination with uh, local law enforcement uh, that will do the training for us. So are we transitioning to PNG then? Or are you, anything else to report? Sean? I'm good unless anybody has any questions. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, policy and governance met on the third. Uh, we went over Appendix 2 and Appendix 6. Um, appendix 2 was just the changes that we talked about at the board table the last time. Um, with the new f agenda format, uh, we would like to bring Appendix 2, Appendix 6, the grievous procedure um, to you at the next meeting to be approved. Um, so they're in there with the changes um, made in the update. Um, I guess, Steve, maybe you can just go over what we did with the grievance procedure versus Appendix 6. Sure. So uh, what we uh, we had an opportunity to uh, take a look at a uh, gap that we had been uh, we had identified in Appendix 6, uh, which was employees in the district that are not represented by one of our collective bargaining units. Uh, and the recommendation from legal counsel was that we develop a specific process, which mirrored that that we use with our uh, collective bargaining uh, units uh, to provide uh, relief for them through that uh, grievance process. So what you have in front of you uh, is uh, a similar mechanism that you would find inside a collective bargaining agreement, but now specified uh, as a, a policy uh, procedure for us to use uh, for those non-represented employees uh, in the district. We also had a discussion on an editorial from the West Side Story that um, was, they were actually asking for a policy um, change or update to the good conduct um, policy. Uh, we discussed that, and uh, it's more of a building level um, change in their in their uh, student handbooks. So uh, we've asked that the three principal, four principals, get together and discuss that. They've already started that process, the convening to work on that. Uh, so just an, another thing I to mention: the students had brought that up. Their editorial vote, board voted unanimously that, that that should be something to look at. So we we looked at that. Uh, we also. Um, talked a little bit about uh, social media use by board members and the cell phone use by students uh, in the schools. Uh, so we had a discussion on uh, those items as well. Okay, comments, questions? Uh, when will you be taking up uh, a fraternization and conflict of interest? Well, the next, it's not gonna be on our next policy and governance meeting. We have two more. Uh, we have a uh, couple more items that we need to get through for this school year to complete our calendar, but it can be uh, added on to that if that's something the policy and governance will take up at their following meeting. Well, it's been sent to policy and governance 
We discussed it once, I believe last year, twice last year, um, with no decision to make a go forward with a policy, but I mean, if it needs to be discussed again, we can. So you'll have it on your backlog of agenda items for future meeting. What's that? You'll, you'll put it on your backlog of agenda items for your future, me for future meetings. Okay, anything else for Paul? Um, so we next item is around the modified FMP update discussion. Um, we've got a bunch of materials that were associated. I think we've seen all of these before. Um, is there anything, Dwayne or Steve, you wanted to add to this? I think one of the things the board is just interested in is making sure that we are staying um, uh, in line with the time expectations that if we were to make a vote on accelerating the FMP, we do it in the time frame that will allow it to actually be accelerated. So I know we wanted that kind of visibility on, on dates and times and prep work leading up to that. Maybe just I'll add a couple things and then let uh, Craig and Dwayne uh, uh, jump in here. But uh, collectively, uh, we've taken a look at some of the, the projects that are out there. We've got three in particular that we'd really like you to think about. Um, two of them are moving up, one's moving back. Uh, the Kirkwood and the Liberty High School projects we think uh, should uh, definitely be considered for acceleration. Uh, we know that uh, Garner, uh, now that we've got a change in the attendance area up there and, and potential changes in the future, uh, we think that uh, we should uh, uh, alternate the Borlaug and Garner plans uh, so that we're better able to meet the needs of students as they're defined right now. So. Um, those are, are three that uh, we definitely think that you should take a look at as you consider um, options for making some changes to the FMP. Right. Yeah, uh, actually, <clears throat> I think what we're going to be recommending is more lock and garner be done in the second year of the program at the same time, so one wouldn't have to go in front of the other. If we delay Garner a year from what we had proposed before, it would end up in the same year as Borlaug. Some of the other logistical uh, things, um, I know the board had presented uh, us with some questions and we'll have some comprehensive answers for those at, at our, when this comes up on the 24th, of course. Uh, but um, as far as our timeline is concerned, that was when we were going to uh, have a more in-depth conversation about this. Mm -hmm. Also, um, just behind the scenes, um, as we uh, have shared with you, there needed to be some internal changes in order for us to uh, 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 free up a little bit more of Duane's time to uh, manage the accelerated projects. And so we've been busy about that and uh, that's going very, very well. Uh, Jeff Barnes is here uh, tonight and he's taken over more of the day-to-day -day operations of our, uh, of our uh, facility management uh, team and uh, that's going very well. Um, We've, uh, uh, we're posting for an, another construction manager at this point in time and uh, hope to get a good candidate uh, for the, uh, that position uh, so that we can monitor these uh, projects internally uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the degree that they need to so that uh, we're watching over our interests uh, in a very thorough manner. And uh, we've done some reorganization with uh, uh, some of our, uh, uh, what we would call our, our day subs or um, our, our moving teams, <laughs> um, where uh, we have a lot of uh, internal transition, as you might expect, for uh, Lincoln and Mann buildings alone, those have to be completely emptied out and put somewhere, right? and uh, Hoover has to move back to Longfellow. And uh, uh, all of those uh, internal transitions take a lot of labor, a lot of time, a lot of logistics uh, for getting all of those things. And so we've um, uh, promoted uh, Paul Dorman to uh, a, a position where he's watching over those and the warehouse at, the, at our uh, Dodge Street Hy-Vee, uh, the old location. Uh, over here that we're renting for that purpose and also our warehouse here. And so um, we're making these internal transitions. Uh, they're going very well. Of course, the funding for these is coming out of uh, uh, the general obligation as we were, uh, as I've shared with you before, uh, the attorney uh, has uh, issued us an opinion that it's okay to uh, take these individuals that are dedicated to these uh, uh, pro projects uh, like our construction manager and, and more of Dwayne's time and so forth out of the general obligation funding stream. And 
and uh, we have some flexibility there um, as we've shared with you uh, by accelerating the projects we're going to be saving on inflation uh, we've already sold bonds uh, at a premium of over three million dollars which is in the bank already um, some of which you'll probably spend on Lincoln quite honestly and then um, uh, we, uh, uh, but, but we're doing really well in that area, and I just wanted to give you an update that uh, I feel internally that we've, um, we're reaching that level that we can manage that capacity and uh, don't seem to be overstressing anyone at this particular time, uh, and uh, that's, that's moving along nicely. So um, all that's been occurring, uh, we're uh, putting together some financial information for you uh, for the 24th uh, as, we, uh, uh, as we move into this uh, whole legislative session with the save and so forth. So you have a little preview of what that might look like uh, and those kinds of things. Not that it'll affect this decision, but I just want you to know what's happening down the road, right? And uh, none of us like surprises, and we always like as much information as we can. So I'm having um, our financial uh, um, our person that helps with, it, uh, with our financial analysis put some of that information together for you as well. So what we would like from you, bottom line, is are there questions that you need answered uh, from us or specific areas that um, we need to address for you to make a, a final decision on on whether uh, we can accelerate the final portion of that plan as as we laid out for you uh, last January when we took this first step. So is there anything specific that you need from us as far as data? Well, it sounds to me like you're putting together the stuff that I want to see and you know as we look at acceleration, you know, we're looking at, are we saving money, but are we also meeting the needs of the students and doing the projects in, in a way that makes sense? And, you know, I am the North Liberty guy, and I've said that, you know, Liberty is going to outgrow it before it gets done. So I appreciate looking at doing that earlier. And uh, I'll speak for Lori. I mean, she's been an advocate for Kirkwood so that there's some pre-K space down at Coralville. So I appreciate looking at that, but I really would like to see you know, we got a lot of numbers of, you know, the initial acceleration plan of what it meant financially and where everything lined up, and that's the kind of stuff I'm going to want to see. Um, I, those were the Liberty and Kirkwood, to be quite honest, were my two uh, things that I was looking at, particularly Liberty. Um, we're short on space everywhere, but I know that that's going to be real tight. Um, I, I, I'm not too sure what the... Garner and, and Borlaug does, but I'd be curious to see how that all kind of lays out on paper. And so just okay. seeing what you're already planning on doing, I think will help me a lot. Right. So just another comment, something for you to think about. We've been talking a lot about capacity. We have the capacity to do it. And I would concur with, with Craig that we do. I don't know if I'm not stressed, but we do have the capacity. Uh, <laughs> But what I want you to think about it in, in, in over the next couple of weeks is that I, I said, let's back up and take a bigger picture. You know, we're talking about in, in 2018 doing $52 million worth of work, and in 2019, anywhere from 50 to $66 million. So that doesn't sound like a huge transition, but it's, there are no projects that are less than a year. They're all two-year projects from beginning to end, and you need to look at the two-year picture. So if you look, if you look at the two-year picture and, and you're looking at 2018 to 2019, now we're talking 100 to 110. And then if you slide that slide rule on down two more years over 29, 2020, we're still looking at 100 to 110. So it's balanced out. And then the third, the third kind of go around in 2021 then drops off to about 80 million. So I think that what you're gonna see in the projected or, or proposed accelerate schedule is pretty balanced. And the reason it's bounced already in 2019 is because we start West High and City High, and we've never changed that. That's on the schedule. That was always there to start. And between those two is an excess of 50 million, okay? So I'm looking at the big, the big picture, the balance over the two years. Can we keep up with the workload with the number of projects and how many we have? And so my, my initial reaction to that is when you look at the big picture two years at a time and you slide that equation, it's pretty balanced over the next six years, or four years. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I think that's worth considering when we get, get around to the actual proposals. Yeah, one, one 
one thing I wanted to uh, say, and especially on uh, with City High and uh, Liberty with what's going on, that uh, we look for opportunities for, uh, we've got uh, ag education scheduled to come online in 1920. Uh, that uh, um, a greenhouse, whether we have uh, an ag program or just biology, would be very beneficial to our school district, uh, especially if we're investing the millions we are in sports um, and uh, career and technical opportunities everywhere that uh, we can uh, at the secondary level, uh, junior high and high school, and um, special ed that we uh, make sure that uh, those concerns are met. And uh, also, uh, you know, when we're, we're talking about uh, uh, when we're, we're talking about athletics that we we consider our main focus as an educational institution there's a couple things um, I don't want to get into the debate today but I do think athletics plays a very big part in individuals uh, academic outcomes as well um, Amy just a couple questions maybe that you can come back with or numbers that we're looking at I know that we see a lot of growth uh, in other areas of town, but I don't want to forget about some of our older schools on the east side of town as well. So I know Lemmy and Wood are some of the schools that are on the list yet to get done. Um, and I know, as Sean can say, he's a Liberty parent. I'm a Lemmy parent. I know their numbers for kindergarten this year, as I've been told, or for next year, are pretty big. And uh, their space is zero. So if we can get that kind of information as well, along with our growing needs that would be helpful we'll do agenda setting a little bit later but i just want to confirm our timeline we'll have a discussion at the 24th meeting is it a work session i guess we can discuss that but it feels like a work session where we've got community members there and then the actual vote would be at the first board meeting in may the eighth. okay mm -hmm. got it yep anything else on this topic um, next one is uh, update on attendance area development meetings planning. I'll give this a crack and Steve and other board members please chime in. Um, but uh, the board has had a number of work sessions around addressing um, uh, uh, balancing our elementary schools. Um, we've talked with principals, we've had community discussions. Um, what we would like to do uh, going forward is um, a multi-step process. One. Uh, begin a community engagement process where we'll go out into the community even yet this uh, school year and talk about the goals and objectives and the real benefits for why we believe um, balancing our elementary schools is so critically important for all of our students. Um, that'll be uh, education awareness, dialogue opportunities, uh, as well as I, I, ability to receive input from community members on what priorities and ideas uh, for solutions are out there. We'll take that information um, and the district will, will work up some proposals of how we might solve some of these issues for uh, the fall 1920 school year. Um, once we get back into the school year next fall, we'll work through what those proposals look like. Again, more community work sessions, uh, input, uh, fine-tuning and refining um, of those potential solutions. And our goal would be to make some decisions in the November timeframe to allow us the time to, to fully and properly implement whatever that solution might look like. Again, this is all gonna take a lot of time. Whatever we're able to implement in the 19, 20 years, probably not gonna be the end all be all final set of um, uh, initiatives, but we wanna get started. This board, um, and I, I think I can say this board, because we've had so many conversations about this, takes this as a very, very big priority and something that we have to move the needle on in the district, we want to do it well, we want to do it thoroughly, but we also want to be timely in how we approach this work. So um, we've had some fantastic feedback and input from the district administration on what are some critical timelines that we need to hit in order to have a successful rollout for the 1920 school year. And so we're kind of working our way back um, from some of those deadlines to make sure that we can pace our work uh, effectively to get there. So um, again, we'll start with some community awareness activities yet this year, and then we'll move into planning um, activities over the summer into the fall. So what did I miss, Steve, uh, other board members that you'd like to add? 
Maybe I'll just jump in real quickly and say thanks to Janet and Lori because they've been uh, working with Kristen and I as we build out a deck that we can take out to the community um, for part of that engagement process uh, that you mentioned. We've also got feedback from the board so we can start to identify some dates that'll work. Uh, at the um, last work session, we talked about making sure that it was important that we have a meeting in each catchment area. So Kristen and I are looking at uh, opportunities to meet at the high school so that we could use some of that large group meeting space that we control so we're not necessarily at the mercy of anybody externally. They might be trying to secure space on a last minute basis type of thing. So um, we're hoping that uh, we can get some potential dates out for you to consider as board members. We know a little bit about your availability from your response to that poll. Uh, so hopefully we can craft, uh, use that to craft some uh, dates that would work and then uh, get those aligned with each of the three catchment areas so we can gather some of that input that you're seeking. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we'll move on. Um, next item in our action item agenda, um, we have um, the proposed FY 2019 budget um, and tax certification page um, and um, any discussion or further um, context needed on this? Just to add, remember, this is part of the annual process that we go through. Uh, it's state prescribed, gives us an opportunity to make sure that um, we are moving forward as we await final budget numbers from the state um, so that we can ensure that our levy maximizes the opportunity for our district. Is there a motion to approve? I move that we approve the fiscal year 2019 proposed certified budget and tax certification page. Set. In unison. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you, Kim. Um, next up, uh, upcoming events, community updates, director liaison report, anything that directors would like to add to this? I'd just like to make a couple comments on some of the things that I participated in. Um, Lori and I, I know both read and Jane, and at least I, don't, I know other people read too, but I read against Jane uh, and one <laughs> at Kirkwood. and. Um, uh, we, we were part of the Book Madness Challenge, which was great. Um, basically what happened at Kirkwood and Grant Wood was that they started with a March Madness bracket of books that were read to all the kids through all the grade levels. Uh, after each one of those rounds, the kids voted uh, what their favorite book was and it moved forward. Mm, cool. um, so the rounds that we participated in were the finals. So at Kirkwood, the final was um, a book called The Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, and that went up against uh, a creepy pair of underwear. <laughs> um, Jane, at our session, read Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, and I read The Creepy Pair of Underwear. Of course. Um, and we, those were the kindergartners. Well, she already had the other book, so it wasn't really <laughs> a choice. Um, when I went over to Grant Wood, um, there, surprisingly enough, their books, uh, the final was also Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, and a book called After the Fall, which is about Humpty Dumpty. Um, I chose After the Fall. Again, uh, uh, the media teacher there, Trish Carty, uh, read Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, and she went first, like Jane did, and they're very animated, and I wasn't, so I know it. <laughs> um, the finals were released on Monday. The students had all voted there, uh, and it was great because they were all very excited about it. It was a secret ballot. Uh, cool. You know, they, had to, they hadn't hidden, and they were all um, voting. And at both schools, uh, Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors was the favorite book wow. amongst all the uh, students at both schools. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so if people out there, if you have kids kindergarten through six, they really love the book, Lo Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, and it's pretty fun. So um, that was one thing. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to mention was that uh, Steve, myself, uh, Adam, and one parent from uh, Lemmy School uh, did make the trip on uh, up to Des Moines, April 3rd, uh, for the day on the hill that we had up there. Um, they were in session, but we did get to talk to everybody. Um, the uh, house at the time was debating the, um, uh, why am I blanking on the, uh, uh, the immigration issue. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, which was very uh, disheartening to hear at the time. 
Um, but the, uh, Stephen mentioned that um, they brought in some of the senators and their representatives. They discussed save with them, and that recently passed uh, the Senate, no, the House, uh, uh, 95 to 3. Um, so that's going back to the Senate. So that's good. Yeah, well, I know. We might, we might need a new representative to read so we can take home some, some of the books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're all good. They're all good books. Yeah. Um, other director updates? If yeah. not, you just made a nice segue to the legislative update. Uh, but sorry, I, I, when I wanted to say that, um, Trish Carter did send me the video. They have a video of all the students at Grant Wood. I don't know if you guys have seen it when they announced the winner. And it was pretty cool to see 350 kids in the gym all going crazy when they announced the winner of the book. So, I mean, it was pretty exciting to see. That's cool. I, I do have something to say, but if you want to go into legislative update first and. Uh, yeah, so I went to the uh, DPO meeting um, at uh, Van Allen uh, Elementary um, on the evening, and they presented um, on circles. So talking about, you know, we'll see at our next restore, or our next ed committee meeting, talking about restorative justice. Um, so there are people in our district, uh, Kingsley obviously is involved in this, uh, who are engaged in these, these uh, circles. And it's not just for discipline. Uh, you know, the concept of circles kind of follows the pyramid. That it's just a way that you go about uh, engaging students. Um, and, and I'll tell you, when you sit and explain it, and maybe especially when I sit and explain it, it sounds pretty hippy-dippy. And, <laughs> and, and I'm sure when I say that, people are like, oh, yeah, JP really likes this. But I'll tell you, the, the, the feeling that and Amy was at the DPO meeting, uh, we chatted afterwards, uh, it was intense. The, the focus of those parents was really, um, I mean, they were focused on those circles. The stories that the teachers told were extremely touching about just some, um, you know, just having a circle to get a freshman class to behave or settle down at this point in the school year when they're not quite there yet. Uh, and some of the transformative stuff that was coming from students, you know, real introverts that were able to come out of their shell um, in this kind of a really safe setting. It was very powerful. Um, the next day I ran into a parent that was there who was like, oh my God, that circles training. I tried it with my daughter and was really, really excited about it. So I had an opportunity then to go uh, to the West High Staff Circle. And so they've been holding these circles. I think this is their fourth one, um, where they just kind of come together and um, it, it's, you know, uh, talking about, um, you know, just different things. I mean, what, what has, it's like the Vegas rule, you know, what is said in the circle stays in the circle. But I can tell you that was a really, and obviously as somebody who was a former staff member, it was, it was really powerful to be there and it felt good to reconnect with those folks. But to have that experience um, in, a, in a way that kids uh, and staff are used to doing it helps you when you get to a problem solving stage. To, to go away from this old discipline model to something that's really transformative, that can really powerfully impact you. And so I'm really encouraging everyone. I'd love to find a way that the board could do it together. Um, I don't know that that can happen, but I really encourage folks that you, you have to experience it. You can't listen to me say it and, think, and then you walk away. You won't have the, the impact. It's probably one of the most powerful things I've seen in education in my entire career as far as its ability to really um, have folks listen to one another to understand one another rather than listen to respond. Um, and that's just one aspect. So it's something I'm very excited about. I don't believe that you know, this is something as a board we can say you must do this. I think that would kill it. I think that's absolutely, it has to come from inside, it has to come from staff and, and um, probably leading the way for students. But now that they've been doing it at West, uh, Rick Hancock's been doing this for a few times. Now he has students just randomly approach him in the hallway. Hey, I think we need to have a circle about such and so incident, whether it's a discipline thing or um, bullying or um, just wanting to talk about some of the issues of the day. And some of these really powerful issues have come out. So if I sound very excited about it, it's because I am. And I really want to encourage my fellow board members to experience it. Um, and the more I think we can get this out there, I think we're going to see some real impact on lots of the things we're talking about, whether it's LGBTQ, bullying, uh, racial disparities. It's just as a very powerful mechanism that uh, is a new thing for us in this district. And it's doing some really powerful work. So thanks, Kingsley, and thanks, uh, folks, for who are doing this. It's exciting. Thanks, JP. That's all I got. Legislative updates. I read the legend of rock, paper, scissors at both schools. Maybe I helped. I'd like um, to say that I did as well. <laughs> all right. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. That's right. I really like rock, paper, scissors. That's why I didn't read it. <laughs> uh -huh. And also maybe uh, just to uh, touch base on uh, JP's comment, we had the chance here uh, right when we introduced that uh, concept to actually do some training here at the uh, administrative office. Uh, obviously, you know, one of the things with the circle is how big is the circle and how do you actually maintain a, a size that gives you that safety and that sense of security where you can have that uh, conversation. So uh, we worked with a smaller group here just to, to go through that process, and it was very, very powerful. Uh, and uh, Paul stole most of my thunder, but uh, uh, yes, we had a great trip to uh, Des Moines. Uh, one of the things that we learned from that is uh, we're going to go much earlier in the session next time. Uh, we worked, uh, for those of you who remember in the past, we used to go uh, as all the UEN districts together. Uh, the UEN Steering Committee looked at that model and said, uh, Margaret's definition of lobbying is to be persistent and relentless. Uh, and we determined that having everybody go on one day um, was great for uh, impact, but on persistence and relentlessness, not so good. Mm. Um, so we spread it out. Uh, we wound up kind of being delegated to going at this time in the session. The one thing that it did provide for us, and, and um, got some feedback from the discussion that took place on the House floor, um, Dave Jacoby, uh, representative uh, for our area, spoke very pos positively and passionately on behalf of SAVE. We had an opportunity to have some uh, pretty extensive conversation with him uh, when we were up there and with our other representatives. Um, so our presence was timely, um, but uh, we think we can have a larger impact if we go a little bit earlier next time. So we worked with our reps and talked to them about how we'll go about doing that next time. Uh, and then uh, SAVE is, is on its way uh, to the Senate uh, with a 95-3 uh, vote. We think that that gives it a very good likelihood of passing in the Senate. So um, we're optimistic that uh, in the, the pretty near future here, hopefully we hear some good news on that. Steve, is that the version with our, would require us to do an RPS or not? Uh, the one that comes out of the House does. Or no, the, our, uh, revenue uh, purpose statement, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, the House does, Senate doesn't, so okay. they may have They'd to reconcile have to. it as they go through it. Thank you, Steve. And maybe just one more for you. I just remember this. Uh, for those of you that keep track, uh, the last uh, per diem day for our legislature is April 17th. Uh, they tend to accelerate their action <laughs> moving towards and past that day. Uh, when we were with them uh, in the Capitol, they predicted um, that even though we have not seen budget numbers yet, they think most of that action is happening behind the scenes and that potentially they could actually wrap the session by the Thursday of that week. Mm -hmm. Um, which, uh, if you think about that, that's the 20th, that's 10 days from now. Seems like they have a lot of work to do between now and then, but uh, the perception that our legislators had was that much of that work is already occurring behind the scenes, and it's simply going to drop ready to go. So we'll need to make sure that we're keeping an eye on mm -hmm. that because it could come fast and furious at the end. Also, Steve, the voucher part in the Senate has kind of just been floating there, so I don't know right. if anything's going to happen by the time they adjourn, but... But they also said beware of the Christmas tree process where ornaments get hung on things at the last minute. So again, something for us to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll move to agenda setting. Um, the uh, April 24th Board of Directors meeting is intentionally uh, not heavy on presentation and discussion items because we have a work session following that meeting. Um, I don't know if directors have any uh, agenda items they want to add, but. Recall, um, we're going to put our energy in the work session on the 24th. Well, we just need to make sure that in the policy review section that we have the three policies that yep. we wanted to bring forward. Oh, and the, uh, LGBTQ, and the LGBTQ statement. Yep. Yep, that's good. Anything else on the 24th board meeting agenda? Um, if not, we've got a work session scheduled. Um, the one topic we have is the modified facilities master plan update. I think we might want to put an item on there, the attendance boundary. Um, and to at least we can share in that form the, 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 the deck, the presentation that we're working on and, and have some discussion there. And I think that will fill the 24th pretty fully. I'm wondering about the Coralville Central solar panel question. Is that something that we need to discuss as a board? Well, well that's a new one on me. Coralville Central, that's a new idea, new, new school. We, have, we do have a solar panel project planned for Liberty Phase 2. We're putting them on the bus maintenance facility up there. Uh, there's a lot of discussion we need to have about putting them on the roof of any building. It's just not that simple. And we have had discussions in the past about those solar agreements and how they pay for themselves. So I think there needs to be some more discussion probably at the Ops Committee before we move that one forward, to be honest. 
Right, and and uh, yeah, there's there's a, there have been some discussions on solar issues, and and with with uh, uh, we have some limitations, and and even though this uh, proposal has some incentives, to the biggest thing is the tax incentives, which do nothing for us. But uh, yeah, uh, there's already been discussions on that. So I, I would think that for one thing, with the gentleman that came in and uh, spoke, that uh, if we can just send him. Uh, the information we have from those past discussions as well, but yeah, that's something we can we can discuss in operations because those uh, operations committee has had those discussions in the past. Mm -hmm. So we're going to tell Henry that that we're putting it in operations committee. Yeah, and and Henry can. Is he's my neighbor, well, so is, I need to know what to oh, tell yes. him. So. Well, Lori, you <laughs> tell Henry he's welcome to come to operations uh, after school, of course. And uh, we would uh, uh, welcome his uh, input on that conversation when we could get it scheduled in. And I, I would love to have a conversation with Henry. He's the kind of thinker we need to have. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Not tonight. <laughs>